Mr. Lincoln, I want to present for their team. Uh, they're probably dying out to stick in the new cat today, so uh, they're probably happy that they're giving their presentation instead of doing that. Uh, their faculty mentors are Pam Ryan and Tony Weistein. And they're going to be talking to us today about the separating the effects of genetic drift and natural selection using a modification of the gene statistics. All right, well, I'm Spencer Tiffany, and this is Karen O'Connell, and that's what we'll be talking about. Um, so first, the overview, we're going to talk about the evolutionary patterns <coughs> of basically what we're modeling and um, how, we, how we modeled them. Um, we're also going to talk about the, yeah, the process of calculating the statistic uh, for these different types of mutation. And finally, we're going to address some challenges and goals that we face. So the part of what we're modeling is the B3 loop of the HIV virus. And uh, basically, this is uh, important for docking to host cell. So changes in the V3 loop that impair that functionality are going to reduce the evolutionary fitness of the organism. <coughs> However, it's also the part identified by the host antibodies. And so uh, mutations in the loop can also increase evolutionary fitness uh, because it will be less, less easily targeted. So the way the simulation works as a general overview is we start out with an original individual. We then create 500 clones, and each generation involves um, involves taking the considering each child. Um, the children choose the parents, and the reason for this is that the sim the simulation considers a constant sized population. Um, the rationale behind this is that 500 we move on 500 individuals, and we figure that's close enough to infinity. Um, although we'll need to verify that assumption. Um, so that we don't really need to consider a population that changes size. Um, also, that will eliminate some of the effects of a, a population that does change size. Um, so the way this works is, instead of having the parents then uh, reproducing directly, we first populate the child generation and then have them choose their parents in reverse um, based on the parents' evolutionary fitness. Um, and that's, within that, it's random. So um, we do this for all the different children in the child generation, repeat that for 999 more times, a uh, total of 1,000 generations, and then we end up with a final population. So uh, for starters, we use the neutral model, which is basically, we don't assume any preference, uh, any evolutionary fitness um, of the parents are all the same. We use purely random mutation and recombination. And what we do this for is this is not only a model in itself, but then we extend this by adding in the effects of selection and drift um, to, to derive our other evolutionary models. So mutation, um, first of all, there are a number of things we consider. Um, not only nucleotide mutations are equally likely, not only do you have transitions and transversions, but also um, in the V3 loop of HIV, uh, nucleotide frequencies are not equal. Um, for example, you might have more C's than A's, and so you need to consider the ratios, the ultimate ratios that you observe in the V3 loops um, when you're considering individual nucleotide mutations. And to cope with this, we use the HPY85 model, which uh, not only does consider uh, transitions versus transversions, but also addresses the fact that you will end up with unequal nucleotide ratios. All right, so the first mode of selection we consider is purifying selection. And basically, this is what I was talking about with the V3 loop um, participating in the host docking. Basically, um, every deviation from the optimal sequence in terms of amino acid coding uh, will decrease the individual's reproductive fitness. And we modeled this with an exponential. Uh, the selection coefficient here is simply the factor by which each deviation decreases the fitness. And then k is the number of amino acid differences uh, from the optimal. And uh, w here is fitness. And the idea here is pretty simple. Uh, basically, you have this optimum. Um, and then any deviation results in a decrease of evolutionary fitness. So diversifying selection is where it is basically um, in, in our simulation, it's where uh, the antibodies are targeting HIV. So you've got um, rare genetic variants. Uh, and basically, if you're not similar to anyone else, then you're preferred. Um, the way we model this is uh, also with an exponential, where the selection coefficient is played the same role as it did last time. And then the average number of differences from others within the population is yeah, inversely tied to that. Um, and what the result is that there's no particular optimum type, it's just that as long as you look different from everybody else, um, you're better off. So those are the two forms of selection. We also model genetic drift. Um, the first form of genetic drift we consider is a 
population bottleneck. And basically what happens here is the population size is dramatically reduced. Um, imagine like a volcano, right? It erupts, buries half the town in lava. Um, it doesn't really matter how evolutionarily fit each individual is. Either they got buried in lava or they didn't, and that's essentially random. So that's genetic drift. Um, and then after some time, the population regains its former size. Um, and in general, this will result in an overall decrease in genetic variation since a lot of them have been eliminated. Uh, the other form of drift we consider is a subdivision, wherein um, the population is split into smaller isolated subpopulations, again, without respect to reproductive fitness, so that's essentially random. Um, in general, this will result in an increased overall genetic diversity. And um, to emphasize the point, because subdivision bottlenecks change the population without considering reproductive fitness, they're forms of genetic drift. And I guess this point deserves special attention. Um, this often results in an increased overall genetic diversity. So to implement um, population subdivision, we have a what's called an isolation matrix. So remember how, how children choose parents. Um, so here we've got two different subgroups. All right, and notice the high numbers here. Point nine is the relative likelihood that child one will choose parent one prime, or child two will choose parent two, or child one will choose parent two prime. And you see that they form a group right here, and then another subgroup down here. Um, 0.1s indicate that child 1 is relatively unlikely to choose parent 3 prime, 4 prime, 4 5 prime. So let's consider what happens when we're choosing a parent for child 4. We take this row of the matrix, and then we consider the parent's reproductive fitness. Now right now we're using the neutral model, so that's all 1. But we could, for instance, evaluate the reproductive fitness using purifying or diversifying selection or a combination of both. Then we multiply um, and construct a new vector, which is then the relative probabilities of child four having each parent. Um, so the big question in all of this is, at any given point, we can see this much from any sample that we choose to take of HIV in a person's bloodstream. But how did we get there? You know, what was the evolutionary history that resulted in that final population? <coughs> to address this question, uh, we used the genus D statistic, um, which will tell us a number of things. If D is, rel is close to zero, then we assume the neutral model. I mean, there's not, there's not really uh, any evidence to suggest anything else. If D is less than zero, this indicates a loss of genetic diversity. Um, and in our scenario, this is often due to uh, purifying selection or population bottleneck. And if D is significantly greater than zero, then we, uh, we conclude that there's an increase in genetic diversity often due to diversifying selection or population subdivision. So if you notice these two components on the right, pi and theta, those have um, specific meanings in, in terms of the organisms, uh, in terms of the final population's genetic makeup. So um, here we have 23 sites across 10 individuals, um, each site being a column of nucleotides. Um, notice in green we have mutations, and any site where there's a mutation is what's called a segregating site. Theta um, gives us the number of segregating sites uh, divided by a correction, actually this is a mistake here, this is a sample of error, but a sample of size. Um, and then uh, pi gives us the total amount of, what it really ultimately boils down to is the amount of diversity within each segregated site. So now that we've learned how to calculate D, um, we're going to kind of talk about our addition to it. Um, we're going to calculate D for two separate sets of data for synonymous and non-synonymous mutations. Um, a synonymous mutation or silent mutation is one in which a uh, mutation does not cause a change in the amino acid that is translated. So you see here, CTT changing to CTA does not change the fact that leucine is inserted into the protein. Um, non standard mutation is the opposite of that. The mutation causes the amino acid inserted to be changed. So you see, CTT to CCT causes the change from leucine to protein. So why do we even care about synonymous and non synonymous changes in the first place? Um, synonymous mutations do not change the amino acid inserted into the protein typically um, within an organism. Therefore, they're not going to change uh, the organism's protein, and they're probably not going to change the organism's reproductive fitness within a population. For that reason, we say that natural selection, which typically acts on reproductive fitness, is not going to act upon synonymous changes that we observe. So the only thing that we're going to say acts upon synonymous changes is the random force of genetic drift. So for that reason, we're going to say our D calculated for, from synonymous data is going to represent the forces of genetic drift in our population. Non-synonymous
sequence changes, on the other hand, can randomly be acted upon by genetic drift, or they can be acted upon by selection by modifying an organism, or through the organism having a different reproductive fitness. So for that reason, we're going to say that D0 minus D sin is going to represent the effects of selection in our population. So we ran into some issues with calculating synonymous and non-synonymous data separately. Um, and we've come up with two main ways to deal with that. Um, I'm going to kind of explain this problem we've run into. This is what we're going to call a singleton uh, mutation from one code onto the other. You see there's probably been one mutation, um, and you see that it has changed the amino acid that is translated. We ran into some ambiguity when we see that there is more than one uh, mutation within a codon. So here we have three different codons within a population in our multiplicant. And we're not completely sure what direction that went or how many of those changes were synonymous or non-synonymous. So what we've done is we've got two methods, one for pi, one for theta, in which we um, decide how much non-synonymous changes happen and how much synonymous changes happen. Pi is we examine all possible directions that uh, a particular codon could be mutated to another codon. And um, in theta, we use a method proposed by Nato Jaworian in 1986. So we'll start with our uh, method for pi. So you see the first codon we have here, GGU changing to AGA. Um, on the surface, it looks like two non-synonymous changes. However, this particular code, the GGU could have mutated to AGA uh, in two, two possible ways. And we see that in fact, there's a synonymous change changing, hiding in the, in the raptors back there. So um, one pathway is completely non-synonymous, the other one is half and half. So what we do is we say that three of the four hypothetical mutations were non-synonymous, and one of the four were synonymous. Uh, we know that there, we're going to say that two changes have happened, because we see two differences, and that's going to cause 1.5 non-synonymous differences and 0.5 synonymous differences. Okay, so that's our method for pi. Theta, on the other hand, considers a column of data down an entire um, codon in the population. So. Um, the theta we use is an angle of one. Now we see that there's two mutations, one in the first position and one in the third position. So that's what we're really going to focus on, the first position and the third position of each code. Um, so we're going to kind of push aside the multiplicating, so we don't, want to, we don't know what to do with it right now, and just focus on the singletons. So we see singletons within the population, and specifically singletons that have a mutation in position one. So we see here there's a non-synonymous mutation in position one, and here there's a synonymous mutation we record these, and then we look at position three. Position three has two non-synonymous mutations. So then we go back to our multiplicity. Now that we've kind of figured out what singletons are doing in this population, we're going to go back to our multiplicity and see what we can do. So we have two ambiguous sites, position one and position three. In the rest of our data, we've noticed that position one, half the time, has been non-synonymous, and half the time has been synonymous. Position three, on the other hand, has always been synonymous. So we count this, uh, position one, has half a non-synonymous site and half a synonymous site. Position three is one non-synonymous site because we always observe that it was non-synonymous in the rest of our data. So this is Nango Jabori's ratio-based method. All right, so now we've got D sin and D non figured out. That's good. Um, so genus D currently indicates an increase or decrease in genetic variation without regard to how it actually happened. Hopefully, uh, by separating out the effects of selection and drift through d sin and d non minus d sin, we can start saying specifically how this increase or decrease in genetic variation has occurred. This summer, things that we're going to be doing would be, um, we need to find a good sample size for HIV. We need to figure out if uh, the finite sites model, uh, if Tajima's D can uh, properly be applied when we do the finite sites model. And, um, we definitely need to make sure that the synonymous mutations that we are assuming are neutral selectively are in fact selectively neutral in all cases that we're dealing with. So the issue of sampling. Um, in one particular uh, blood sample drawn from one patient, uh, sequencing more than 20 HIV individual virions is uncommon. It's difficult to do, it's expensive to do, and we're wondering if a small sample size of 20 we're going to have representing a population of 500 is enough, what sample size is appropriate? These are the questions we need to answer. 
Um, an infinite finite size model is a kind of different challenge. Um, an infinite size model is one in which one mutation happens per site along your data set. Um, a finite size model is one in which more than one mutation can happen per site along your data set. The D statistics currently assumes infinite sites. Here, you see in this population of data, we have, um, let's see, we have one, two, three polymorphic sites. The likelihood that these three polymorphic sites have more than one mutation at them is extremely low. However, once we observe more variation in our population, like we would observe in HIV, um, we see many more variant sites. And the likelihood that each of these variant sites only has one mutation is going down pretty drastically. So we are pretty sure that HIV operates underneath the finite sites model. So Tejima's D is calculated underneath the infinite sites model, and HIV probably operates underneath the finite sites model. Can we still use D for HIV? That's the challenge that we hope to address this summer. So then uh, goals, once we get over our challenges, um, we would like to uh, generalize our models for more genes, more organisms. Um, a lot of that has to do with types of mutations that we, we would observe. And, uh, and make sure that our calculations of D, those two methods that we've uh, come up with to deal with ambiguity and calculating D for synonymous and not synonymous data, um, we want to make sure that those are in fact accurate and not just, you know, created and don't work. We calculate distributions of D for each of the four evolutionary patterns that we've introduced in the neutral model. And then um, we would like to be able to take a D statistic calculated from a patient's blood sample and compare it to all our distributions and say which distributions were most likely representative of what's happening inside this individual. So if we see that our data point best fits purifying selection, we can say, hey, this HIV is going on underneath purifying selection right now. Um, so that's kind of a goal, and we would, we would probably use Bayesian analysis to do this. We'd like to thank our delightful mentors, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Weinstein. Uh, Diane Kopp, of course, and Joyce Tipping are crucial parts of our team. And uh, Dr. John Vett kind of helped us get off the ground as far as uh, programming was concerned. National Science Foundation, Math Bio Initiative, and Truman State University definitely make this possible. Hi, I had a 
a question about that same step. The, the matrix that had the probabilities uh, a particular road didn't add up to one. I was wondering about that. It seems like you could have um, greater, you know, m more than 100% chance of having a parent. Oh. And, and, and then the other thing I was asking about is when you go, when, if the population goes through a bottleneck and you have a small number of individuals, how, what's the procedure for building up individuals? Do you just arbitrarily say like, okay, every generation I'm gonna add two children or some proportion of the population we size is getting like, added? Or? We would ideally like to like, like each of these models is very ideal, you know, and there's different variations that we would like to do. For example, selection models, we would like to have like different selection strengths, see how that affects our distribution. Um, but in bottleneck specifically to read growth, we have several ideas as to like where to impart the bottleneck and then I think now we have logarithmic growth coming back. But I'm not, I mean, we definitely have to play with that a little bit and see how much it actually varies their distributions. Um, but we do have several like types of each evolution sure, yeah, pattern yeah. that we would like to kind of Different versions of rules you could implement. Yeah. To address your first question, um, the probabilities are relative. So what we end up doing is we we just take the sum, divide each number by the sum, but that way we don't have to worry about putting numbers in there that are harder to think about. It's just a, it's a shortcut of what we're doing. But it ultimately, it'll ultimately be equivalent to making it all add up to one anyway, because we just divide each number by the sum of the, of the row. Each, each number of what? Each, each number of the row of the matrix. So anytime basically we have relative probabilities and you have to pick one of a bunch of them and add them to more than one, we'll divide each uh, member of that row by the total, and that way you end up having a row that sums to one, so you can do normal probability. Uh, okay, I understand. So really what those values are, are kind of uh, a within row weighting. Yeah, it's all relative. Okay, got it. you were talking about the optimal type based on the phenotype. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if you guys are talking about the DNA structure and the nucleotides, why don't you consider your optimal type in the genotype? <coughs> oh, I see what you're saying. We actually do, within the model, we don't consider phenotype as an optimal. We have an optimal like genotype. Okay. That was just sort of like uh, kind of an idea picture, you know, like not really literal translation. but. Um, it is a selection, so we do only consider non-synonymous changes. So in that respect, we are kind of using only phenotype and amino acids, you see what I'm saying? But genotype um, is actually what we're measuring to in the model. Uh, I was interested, you said you're going to test the 
synonymous with patients to see if they really are neutral. I can think of three or four ways that you can affect the rate of transcription, translation, or mm -hmm. survival of mRNA, things like that. So how are you going to? That's just a huge literature search. That is just paper upon paper of how can synonymous changes change the organs. Like right now, within the V3 loop, we've done a little bit of research this past week and found that, for example, uh, alternative splicing, right? Splice sites, the variation of splice sites is a huge thing where synonymous mutation actually does cause a you know, different fitness. Um, but we found within the V3 loop, it doesn't have any variable splicing within it. In fact, the V3 loop is a big chunk that is either kept or not kept in an exon or intron. In HIV studies, they're currently out. So maybe they'll change, who knows? But once we start generalizing this thing to other genes, to other organisms, that's going to be a huge task. I've got a question. Uh, your, it seems like your model can only account for uh, any single base changes three times. Can you account for, so you, you have the original base and then you can change to any of the three other nucleotides. Is there any way to account for a reversion back to the original? Um, we do have an idea with some of the like verifications. We have, we came up with this method this past week and um, we were thinking of actually like having the computer like tell us every single time that it makes a mutation so that we know that we're calculating it accurately. Um, but we have to get like running simulations done before that happens. But home thing is absolutely a mess to deal with. Because you have no idea, right? Like, maybe it's one change. Maybe it's 3,000. Yeah. Yeah. We've considered, um, well, we're, we're working with developing a model that considers, um, considers that very phenomenon. And instead of returning, instead of giving us the actual number of mutations that were observed, it takes the number of observed mutations and then gives us an expected number of mutations. But at the moment, we're not sure whether that's actually sound as far as biology. Well, that's sad, that's a, that uh, hopefully we'll be able to use this on real data sets. And in real data sets, we don't know which mutations. So we're trying to model what we would actually 